and died in grace I found their heart's desire Gaze upon the Savior's face Sing, sing, O heavenly choir Sing, all you angels gathered round the throne of God Most high, sing with the saints and all created things to pray Good morning, everybody, and welcome to worship here this morning at Golden Grove Uniting Church. <clears throat> great to have you with us and great to be together, and uh, most especially uh, the greatest privilege to be gathered into the presence of God our Father this morning, and the presence of the Holy Spirit, the presence of Jesus Christ, uh, his Son and our Lord and Saviour. We're going to begin now with a song that uh, really speaks of our thirsting and longing for that presence of God, as pants the heart for calling streams. And we'll have another worship song to follow this, so you might like to remain standing afterwards if you'd like to stand. As pants the heart for calling streams. <laughs>
and the King of Love has come, our next song. Let's come in prayer now before God the Father with our prayers of confession. Let's pray. God our Father, we confess the things we try to hide from you. Things we try to hide from others. The things we try to hide from ourselves. We confess the worry and heartbreak that we have caused others and the things we have said and done which make it hard for them to forgive us. 
We confess the times we've made it easy for others to go wrong. We confess the harm we have done and cannot undo, making it hard for us to forgive ourselves. Lord, have mercy. Forgive us and renew us. Amen. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, in great mercy, has given his Son, Jesus, to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. And so by the authority of Christ, I declare to you the forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And um, an oldie and a goldie, what a friend we have in Jesus. We're thinking very much about prayer today, and uh, from James 5, the prayer of faith. And so what a friend we have in Jesus, a song that sings very much about that. <laughs> a seat. <clears throat> Just in the way of uh, notices today, please uh, refer to your copy of the Gazette for notices that you need to be aware of. Good morning everyone. Uh, it's come to that time of the year when uh, church council elections are about to start. And as a consequence, um, I'm addressing this today uh, to let you know that uh, nomination forms will be available next week, uh, the 24th. Uh, nominations will close on the 7th of November at 12 noon, and the names of nominees will be published on the 14th of November for people to peruse in the Gazette. And on the 5th, we will have a congregational meeting solely for the purpose of electing elders and councillors. At this stage, I'd just like, uh, as we're considering prayer today, to consider this in prayer uh, during this period. Uh, pray for the elections and pray that everything runs smoothly and that we have uh, good people uh, next year on our council. Thank you very much. Uh, and all this will be published in uh, next week's Gazette. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. <clears throat> I 
I know that um, we've uh, shared quite a bit about uh, our a recently new grandson with you as a congregation. You've known a bit of the story, and uh, I just want to tell a, a bit of that story again, I guess, today, in light of the fact of uh, our theme, looking at James 5, and uh, the theme of the prayer of faith and the effect of that. And uh, just to recount for you, um, our son, or when our daughter was pregnant, at the, her 20-week scan, uh, revealed what was thought to be a very rare condition with a number of fairly major possible effects, ranging from minor to severe. And uh, mostly this condition could have affected the optic nerve and vision, but having other developmental uh, implications as well. And a medical specialist at the Women's and Children's Hospital repeatedly urged our parents, our daughter Hannah and her husband uh, Jared, to terminate the pregnancy. <clears throat> and so with great angst, uh, Jared and Hannah refused to terminate the pregnancy and to trust the pregnancy and their unborn child to Christ's grace. And... Uh, they and their unborn child were surrounded with prayer. Many, many of us here, many of you were part of that. Uh, Judah was born on the 21st of December last year, healthy and without apparent issues. And uh, they did an MRI scan at the end of the first week. And uh, the doctors believe this showed that he did have a narrow optic nerve uh, and uh, Upon that, they diagnosed the condition of uh, what's called septo-optic dysplasia, which has these possible vision and related effects. And they actually predicted pretty dire outcomes. And um, progressive testing by a team of specialists from the women's and children's over the first six months, each time um, observed healthy growth and no signs of septo-optic dysplasia. And uh, at home, Judah continued to develop into a thriving, exceptionally content and happy baby, uh, bringing delight to his family. And then f at the final assessment at the end of six months, uh, they did testing on Judah and on his optic nerve and they determined that it was completely normal and that there were no clinical signs of septo-optic dysplasia. Um, and uh, so we've just been amazed, I guess, and uh, uh, just blown away by the goodness of God uh, in all of that. You know, whether it means medical profession got things very wrong or whether there's been healing or both, we trust that into God's hands and are just amazingly thankful. And uh, I know it's very indulgent for a grandfather, but just share a couple of photos with you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, there's, there's the first one of Judah and his dad, Jared, up the river. And as you know, Jared's a ruckman for the Eagles. I'll show the next photo. And uh, this was on uh, grand final day. And he was, he was testing out the quality of the metal there, I think. And uh, just a little brief video snap. But uh, we'll be hearing today how prayer is powerful and effective. And uh, sometimes the, the answers to prayer are as we might most hope. Sometimes they're not and different and we'll be looking at that as well. All of these things within the goodness of God's love and grace towards us. Uh, we're going to come now to spend a bit of time in prayer. And uh, Neil has mentioned our 
elders and church council elections coming up. We want to pray for that and for our ongoing leadership in the congregation, um, as well as the many other concerns that there are uh, in our lives, in our world. And we'll have a chance to mention those as well and then uh, concluding with the Lord's Prayer. So let's come now in prayer. <clears throat> A dear God, our Father, we, we are in so many ways part of a, a broken world that experiences much pain and suffering and loss. I guess uh, particularly we're aware of that during this ongoing time of the pandemic. And Father, to know you is to know that you and your love and your grace are greater than the world and all of its brokenness. And to know you means that we, we bring all need and concern to you in our prayers, to your throne of grace. And so we do that, Father. We think of the world still in the grip of the pandemic and our nation and state and, and just a lot of uncertainty yet as to how things may unfold. We continue to pray that this may be a time where people throughout the world in the stress of the pandemic see afresh their need of you and look to you that it may be a time, Father, where people realise that you are the God who is with us in all that we go through, all of our suffering. And, Father, that we, we do look to you in faith and find that you renew our hope and lead us through. And Father, we pray also that you will rid the world of this disease. And we pray for all of those who are suffering and we pray for healing. We pray for the rollout of vaccines. We pray for remedies. We pray for your healing power. And Father, we, we think of all the situations of great need and suffering in the world together in this same prayer. We pray for our nation, Father, for our leaders, for you to guide, direct, correct and bless them so that your will will be done for our nation. We pray particularly, Father, for all of those, and especially those we meet in day-to-day -day life, who don't know Jesus Christ, who don't know your love and grace and salvation in him. And we pray, Father, that they will come to thirst and hunger for it and seek it. And we pray that we, your people, would bear witness and share the love and truth of Jesus with those who don't know it. Wherever we can, we pray that you'll enable us and prompt us to. And we pray that your Holy Spirit, Father, will draw people to faith in Jesus Christ into this church family and all church families. Father, uh, we are... Uh, bring in prayer the elections we have coming up for elders and church councillors in our congregation. And we pray, Father, that you would prompt by your Spirit those amongst us to consider serving in those roles, serving you, serving the gospel of Christ, serving one another within the church council and eldership, and serving the congregation in the best way that we can.
Father, we also bring before you now in prayer many other concerns and needs that are on our hearts and minds and spirits, and we bring them now before you. Father, we bring all of these prayers confidently before you because Jesus has come and revealed to us your great mercy. We also confidently pray to you the words of the family prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Do not let us be tempted and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our next uh, hymn this morning is a hymn that speaks about where all confidence for prayer and answer for prayer comes from, in Christ alone. And we'll stand together to sing this, and during the singing of this hymn, we will also wait on you for your tithes and your offerings. <laughs>
take a seat. Let's just pray in uh, dedication of our offering. Our Father, uh, remembering the offerings that are made here today and also those that many make by other means and electronically and uh, those who are not with us today and giving as a part of their own worship. Father, we, we pray in great thanksgiving. You've given so much, Father. You give so much. You've given the fullness of your grace in your Son. And we give to you these gifts and our lives and we ask that you receive them and bless them in the service of your love. Amen. Now have the gospel reading for this morning, or the, the Bible reading rather. Yes. This morning's reading comes from James chapter 5, verses 13 to 20. The prayer of faith. <clears throat> Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So uh, <clears throat> prayer makes a dent in the world. It's true. We just heard, that, heard it from our Bible reading amongst the words that were uh, read to us there. The prayer of a righteous, the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again and the heavens gave rain and the earth yielded its harvest. Prayer is powerful and effective. In the late 1980s, I was studying um, international politics and including uh, the politics of communism and the Soviet Union. And uh, over much of that century, the Soviet Union had become very powerful and it appeared on the world stage like an utterly immovable uh, object. And uh, I studied at the time under the professor of Sovietology. He was a clever guy. But then one night in 1989, the Soviet Union collapsed. It vanished. And we, we watched ordinary Berliners on TV smashing up the Berlin Wall with hammers and uh, taking home bits of it as souvenirs. Many Christians had prayed for years for the collapse of communism and the Soviet Union with its anti-Christian thrust. Uh, I'm not sure what a professor of Sovietology did after that. Uh, but we could also say may our prayers also be answered for the collapse of the anti-Christian thrust in our Western capitalist society too. During the uh, drought of the early 2000s, <clears throat> on the Bullaroo Plains, the Christian churches gathered 
with the wider community to pray for rain. And we had an outdoor worship service at Appala Springs. And uh, the following week, we had three to four inches of rain fall. Uh, my wife, Catherine, her brother, Paul, works amongst the Laritia people in the Tanami Desert. And uh, soon after beginning his work there, an Aboriginal lady spoke to him one day and about how she had prayed for her sick daughter and God had healed her. And uh, Paul reacted with a bit of amazed surprise and the lady said, why are you surprised? We prayed, God healed her. That's just what happens. And uh, Paul says how he felt shame at that moment. Many people in our church family have experienced being sick in various ways or in great need and you've prayed to God and he has healed you and met those needs. What did we expect? Prayer is powerful and effective. James is focused on prayer in chapter 5. As you know, we've been having a bit of a series on James and uh, this will be uh, our final one today. But he says, If any are suffering, then they should pray. If any are sick, they should call on the elders to pray and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord Jesus. So he's saying that uh, a ministry of prayer and healing is just a regular necessary part of the life of the church family. It's not exceptional. Uh, It's not just to be used in extreme moments. Whether it's cancer or a cold, we should be praying. And it's not just to be done by some in the church either. Um, but by every member of the church family. When it says in James 5, he speaks about the elders being requested to pray, it's not meaning that the elders are the only ones to pray, Uh, nor that they are more effective than anyone else praying within the church. The elders simply represent the ministry of the whole body of the church, and that's why James mentions them here in the way that he does. So we ought to be praying for one another for healing all the time. But why? Seriously, why would we do that? Well, because it's powerful and effective, yes. But why would James and we be convinced that God is going to hear us? and answer powerfully and effectively when we ask. Well, James says that we are to pray in the name of the Lord. So in other words, we know the Lord's name. And in the Bible, knowing the name of someone means you know the person. You have a relationship with them. You share life with them. And from our knowing him, what's he like, this God? Well, he's the God who loves the world and us so much, is so committed in faithfulness to us that he stepped into our world and our lives. He shouldered our pain and sickness and sin and he died to forgive and heal it all. That's that's the kind of God he is. That's the kind of love he has for us. And I don't know what you can say to adequately say what you'd need to about a love like that. And Paul didn't know what to say either. So it just kind of burst out of him. In uh, my paraphrase of Romans 8, Paul says, This God is so much for us, nothing can be against us. His love is so great He must, in the end, save us through and from all that troubles us in life. Full stop. You see, the God who is that much for us, if we truly know him, how could we not be always going to him in confident prayer that he will heal and save us? 
If we don't, the question would be, do we really know him? Uh, Catherine has always known that her dad loves her to bits and would do anything for her. And so as a kid, she tells how she had so much confidence in his love and care for her that uh, she, was, she would unswervingly believe that he would and could always fix anything that was wrong. Uh, so she went to him constantly with every possible request you could think of. And she knew that he would do for her what she asked and fix it up for her. Then uh, one day she broke her little three-wheeler trike and she went to her dad and asked him to fix it. She handed it to him, anticipating that everything would be hunky-dory again in just a few moments. Anyway, dad looked at it, he considered the damage, and then he said to her, actually, I can't fix that. Her world fell apart. It was a growing experience. Well, needless to say, uh, Dad isn't God. But if the love of, that Dad had for Catherine would make her go to him constantly with any and every request, how much more for us to God our Father who has loved us in the way he has, would make us go to him constantly with every prayer and request. James tells us that the kind of prayer we are to pray <clears throat> is the prayer of faith. Well, what's that? It's very simple, actually. It's, it's what we just heard a young Catherine Traeger doing, freely asking her dad to meet any and every need and trusting him to do that. But sometimes we get complicated ideas about what the prayer of faith is that don't necessarily have much to do with what James was talking about. For example we can think that the prayer of faith must mean praying in which we are not allowed to have even one tiny skerrick of doubt whatsoever. In other words, only praying when and if we have absolutely perfect faith. But if we believe that, we can think that we have to kind of work ourselves up into a spiritual lather screwing up our minds with determination to force out even the slightest thought of doubt. And then, if we pray and someone doesn't get healed, what's the logical conclusion? Well, someone's faith must have failed, either the person praying or the person being prayed for. If we approach prayer that way, it is a cruel, soul-destroying burden. And it's just plain wrong. So in Mark 9, there's a man with a son who's demon-possessed. He comes to Jesus and he prays. He asks Jesus if he will heal the boy. And Jesus says to the man, just believe. And the man says, I believe but help my unbelief. In other words, he's saying, I believe and I don't believe at the same time. Or he has faith and he has doubts at the same time. Much like all of us when we pray, if we're honest. And what happened? Jesus delivered and healed the boy. So the prayer of faith in James 5 doesn't mean having no doubt whatsoever or having only perfect faith. Jesus said on another occasion that the faith a Christian needs only has to be as big as a grain of mustard seed. 
Or sometimes we could think that the prayer of faith means acting in a, a, an especially bold way or operating in command mode. And what I mean by that is commanding an illness or a spirit to go or commanding that a person be made well. But commanding is not actually prayer. Prayer is asking God to do something for us. That's something quite different. Now we know that Jesus commanded spirits and illnesses. And there are special instances where he commanded the 12 apostles to do so. And there may be instances where he directs his followers to do that today. But in James 5, he's talking about healing through prayer, which is asking God to do something for us. And this throws us back totally on the grace of God. The prayer of faith means simply doing what that man did in Mark 9, running to Jesus, crying out to him for his hurting boy, with all the faith that he could muster, mixed up with whatever doubts he had too, and asking specifically for help and healing, and throwing himself completely on Jesus' loving, merciful promise to help and save all who call on him. Simple as that, crying out to Jesus, trusting him. Now, our passage in Mark, in, sorry, in James 5 also famously speaks about being anointed with oil. What's that about? Well, it's not a little magical extra that we do only on special occasions, just when an illness might be particularly serious. And it's not that oil has got some special power or the elder who might use it. In the Bible, oil is a symbol for the Holy Spirit and for God's presence and blessing. So using it is saying something. It's saying something about our absolute dependence for life and health and salvation resting only in the Holy Spirit and on God. So that's, oil is a, is a symbol of that. But oil was also simply medicine. Do you remember the parable of the man who fell among thieves? What did the Samaritan do for the wounded Jew? He poured on oil and wine. Oil to soften and soothe the wounds and wine which is antiseptic. And many commentators believe that the anointing oil means both our complete dependence upon the Holy Spirit and God and making use of all the available medical help that God puts in our way. Now, as Christians, we're not to spurn uh, medicines or doctors. We are to earnestly receive them with thanks as good gifts from God the Father and pray that he will heal us through them, as well as pray for the direct healing power of the Holy Spirit. Um, I knew a fine young Christian man. Uh, he, he was also a lad's lad. He was a state motocross champion. But uh, he once had a crash and broke his forearm. And he knew it. Uh, the doctor and x-ray told him, as well as the pain. But anyway, he believed at the time that he should just trust God to heal him and not use the perfectly good medical help just down the road to reset his arm and get rid of the pain. He hung on for three months. And then finally he submitted to surgery. He knows a lot better now and has a bit of a laugh about it.
Now, with all that said, is it true that the prayer of faith always results in God healing the person that we pray for? Well, some say, yes, there it is written. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. But the phrases uh, save the sick and the Lord will raise them up are about not only physical, but also spiritual healing too. And so God can raise and save someone spiritually while physical sickness may still persist. And to raise them up above all else points to the final total healing. Resurrection from the dead in the new heaven and the new earth. Now, God is always responding to our prayer of faith to effectively bring about his best purposes for us, our ultimate healing. But that may not be when or how we might think it should happen. And that's because God knows much more and better than we do. Did Jesus, let me ask you a question, did Jesus pray the prayer of faith? Well, uh, of course, we'd have to say, if anyone in Scripture did, Jesus did. Of course he did. Well, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was under great physical and emotional and spiritual oppression and threat, And he prayed to God the Father, if it be your will, take this away from me. He prayed it three times. Did the Father do what Jesus asked? No. Well, does that mean Jesus wasn't praying rightly? Hardly, son of God. Well, does that mean then that God the Father failed him or that he stopped loving Jesus? Well, of course he didn't stop loving him. So that leaves only one possibility. God the Father was truly loving his son, Jesus. He didn't fail him, but had a greater plan for him in order to fulfil love and salvation for the world through his suffering and death and resurrection. And also the Father did save and heal and raise up Jesus in the perfect way, in the perfect time, in his resurrection from the dead to eternal life. So why then in the garden did Jesus pray to be delivered from that? Well, because becoming human like us, he also accepted human limitation. And so in doing that, he didn't have the Father's full knowledge of all the things that were going to be necessary in order for him to fulfill uh, fulfill that best plan of God. And uh, for, the, for the, what was the absolute right way for Jesus didn't have all that knowledge at that point. You see, the same as when we pray. You know, we, we look around us, we look at ourselves and we make our best judgment about what our needs are and we pray um, and... Uh, We think we have an idea about the the best way forward, but uh, we don't see and know everything that God the Father sees and knows in his wisdom and in his love. God's always at work bringing the fulfilment of his best plan about for us. Now, just to finish... And I've left uh, the killer till last. James says that the prayer of the righteous man 
or woman is powerful and effective. The righteous man or woman. So, well, uh, we could say at that point, oh, great, it's the prayer of the righteous he's talking about here. Um, then I might as well just pack up and go home then. Forget about it. So much for that, James. Thanks a lot. Uh, where are we on the righteousness scale? Now, I actually know, so let me tell you, all over the shop, um, truly amongst us and in us all, there is the good, the bad and the ugly. And, uh, but notice James says, pray like Elijah, a man just like you, have you read the story of Elijah in the Old Testament? Yep, in him too was the good, the bad and the ugly. As well as being a great man of faith, Elijah also got scared, depressed, doubted, he sinned. You see, just like us. And yet... James is holding him up as the example of a righteous man whose prayer is powerful and effective. So how can Elijah and we be righteous? Well, John says, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. You see, Jesus Christ is the righteous man. And he has died for the sins of all, so that through faith in him, his righteousness becomes our righteousness. And so the Father looks at you and me and he sees his righteous sons and daughters just as he sees Jesus. And uh, John said there how Jesus advocates for us. He, he prays for us to God the Father. You know, Jesus praying for us. Surely that's got to be the most faithful, powerful, effective prayer in the universe. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, he dwells in us. And we dwell in him. And our lives are completely wrapped up and included in Jesus' life. Every move I make, I make in you. You make me move, Jesus. Every breath I take, I breathe in you. It's the song we sing. And we'd also have to add to that the lyrics, every prayer I pray, I pray in you, Jesus. Our prayers and our life are wrapped up in Jesus' prayer and life. Jesus prays his perfect prayer. And we are in him and our prayers, which may be up, down and all over the place, trusting in him by grace, our prayers are taken up and become a part of his perfect, powerful, faithful prayer. And at once, God, our good, good father, responds with all love and mercy and power to Jesus' prayer of faith and to our prayer of faith. Amen. We're going to sing 
a song now. I think this is one that we have sung before, but a while back. And it speaks about the reality of what we've been looking, looking at. We come with faith. And uh, we've often also got our doubts and we've got all of our weaknesses and foibles. But we come in faith in Christ. That all that he is and all that he has and does is for us. And by grace comes to us. And this is a song that speaks about us coming in prayer and all of our, all of our weakness, but trusting in Christ. And our prayers are taken up in him and become a part of his perfect prayer, his all-powerful prayer. And the Father responds with the greatest effectiveness to those prayers. I know not how to pray, O Lord. <laughs> Let me 
say these words of benediction for us from Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us this day and stay with us forever. Amen. Have our final uh, song in just a moment. Uh, before we do, just to invite you to join us for morning tea in the hall following the service, uh, remembering uh, COVID safe practices and um, we're going to sing, and also if there's anybody who would like prayer, uh, we shouldn't forget that today, um, for healing or for any other need, there'll be somebody can meet with you at the front of the church following the service to pray with you. Um, another prayer to finish with, Spirit of Heaven, flood over me.